Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. My name is Marshall, thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we've got a Universal Genève and this is actually from a friend of mine and uh, he's a fellow watch collector and he said, look, I love this little watch. It's a great little dress watch, but I'm having an issue with it. Sometimes the hands get out of alignment and it feels like they're too easy to set. So is there anything you can do? And I said, sure, let me take a look at it. And as you can see, it needs a little cleanup too. It's a little dirty. The, the crystal has a little crack in it and it's a little bit scratched. And uh, it probably could just use a service as well. So we're just gonna go ahead and go through this whole thing, try to figure out if we know what the deal is with the hands and then uh, also see if we can't get this thing running proper. As you can see, there's a little, maybe a crack on the bezel or something. Not 100% sure, we're gonna have to investigate that. But first, let's put it on the time grapher and see how it does. Hey, this isn't actually too bad, right? The, the, it's it's not keeping good time. It's losing almost 30 seconds a day, but the amplitude seems fine and the beat error's not really where you want it to be. But for a vintage watch that's uh, something that he wears on occasion, this is totally fine. In fact, even getting a little bit better, but still it could probably use a service. So we'll go ahead and do that uh, and make sure this thing's running in tip top shape for, for our friend. And then uh, we'll, we'll give it a cleanup, new crystal and investigate the hands issue. Okay, so first we need to get into this thing. We'll take, we'll start by taking off the watch strap and this has those little handy bars on them so that you can just uh, take off the strap without needing any tools, so that's kind of cool. And now we can take this outer bezel off and yeah, no, that did not feel right. So the bezel came off with effectively no pressure um, at all and you can see there's some rust on the bottom as well. How bad is this rust? Uh, it doesn't look great, but it's not terrible. So we'll have to play around. And yeah, the crystal just pops right out with really no resistance. You can see the crack on the crystal and it's also kind of worn. And that makes me think that we may have an issue here with this little crack area on the bezel that it may not be holding tight. So that's something that we're gonna have to uh, address and, and take a look at when we can look a bit closer at it. But for now, we can uh, continue our way through. And as you can see, the hands do set. So that's good. So let's get the hands taken off of this. This thing has a really nice dial on it. It's like a, a porcelain or, or enamel dial, I'm not sure. It's a really nice clean white, although it has picked up a bit of dirt on it. Hands, very simple, as you can see, Roman numerals around the outside. This is just a kind of one of those really nice little finds for, for a dress watch. It's very thin, very elegant. And now we can take the back of the case off. See, and that's how it's supposed to feel. There should be some resistance there as well. Let's take a look at the movement. Nice. Nice little movement there, just ticking away. And, and like I said, it was running pretty okay anyway, so that's good. And we'll take the crown out. This one has one of the pressure crowns. It has a spring rather than a screw that holds it in place. And now we can take the case clamps off so that the movement can come out of the case. And you can see there's some rust around the inside as well. And we'll probably need to uh, try to at least get that cleaned up a little. It looks like cosmetic stuff. It doesn't look like the part is actually rusting through or falling apart. So that's good news. Now we can remove the dial from the movement. There we go. Yeah, dial looks like it's in really good shape as well. Again, this watch overall is in pretty good condition. I've got a little dial holder that we can put the dial in here as well. This just keeps it safe so that it doesn't get banged up or scratched while I'm working on other parts of the watch. And we can take the hour wheel off and we'll move the uh, movement onto a movement holder. Now, one of the things, especially for those of you who are looking to get into this hobby, is watches like this are very much the same as, as 
anything else from this era, but they are smaller. As you can see, this movement is tiny. It's really small. And if you are just starting out, um, you should start on something bigger. You know, I usually recommend something like a pocket watch movement. You can find those on eBay for very cheap. There was a, a long era where pocket watches were the only type of watches for people to use. And after they went out of fashion, um, a lot of the pocket watches were, the movements were taken out of their case and the case was melted down for scrap metal. Now, the next thing we need to do here is take down, let down the mainspring. And as you can see, all I have to do to do that is move the click out of the way and then gently let the wheels go through my fingers here until the mainspring is completely exhausted. And there you go. That's an important-ish thing to do. It's not entirely critical, but it's the recommended procedure because that way the mainspring doesn't unwind all in one motion, which can cause damage to it primarily, but even to other things potentially. So it's the preferred method is to do this, to, to let it down gently and make sure that you kind of uh, empty the gas tank as it were. But anyway, with the pocket watches, so th that means that the movements were left over and those aren't particularly useful to anybody outside of maybe me and you who might wanna poke around at them and restore something or work on it. So you can find those for a good price and they're much, much bigger than this, which makes them easier to work on. Okay, we're gonna continue disassembly of this little Universal Genève movement. This is the ratchet wheel. And attached to that are the click, and then underneath that is the click spring right there. We'll go ahead and take off the crown wheel now. Some crown wheels are held on by one screw, and some are held on by two. This one's held on by two little tiny screws. It's always worth remembering that the ones that are held on by one screw are almost always a reverse threaded screw, which means you turn the screwdriver the opposite way that you'd think. And if you turn it the way that you normally would, you'll probably shear off the screw, so always be careful. And that's I kind of why I like the two screw method here, though they are absolutely tiny. Just taking a quick look, and that's actually a shouldered screw, so I'll remember that when it comes to putting the movement back together. And now the click can come out. And now I can grab the click spring. I'm just gonna use a stick here just to kind of stabilize a little bit to prevent it from hopefully flying away. There we go. And now we can take the barrel bridge off. This is a very straightforward movement. Uh, there's no calendar on this. There's no chronograph. There's no anything. It's just what we call a two-hander. Minutes and hours, that's it. Not even a second's hand. And that's pretty uh, traditional to find that on a dress watch. A lot of dress watches will, will only have two hands. We'll take the barrel out. But I realized I haven't actually taken off the uh, the cannon pinion here. So I'm just gonna kind of flip things over, but it's, yeah, that's, that's what's gonna happen. <laughs> the train wheels are gonna come out, but that's okay. If they fall out, that's one thing. If you try to yank them out of there, uh, that's a much different thing. But the center wheel is attached to the cannon pinion on the other side, so it will not come free until I release the cannon pinion. And for that, my handy dandy cannon pinion remover. There we go. It safely and cleanly removes the cannon pinion, which is right there. Now that's something that we're gonna to wanna to take a look at as well because that could be the source of the issue. If it's too loose, then that could be why the hands are falling out of alignment. Okay, now we can get in and take off the pallet bridge and the pallet itself, which means we've almost got this thing completely apart. Okay, there comes out the bridge and that leaves the pallet fork just sitting there in its pivot. 
it'll just come out by itself. And we can flip the movement over now and get busy on the keyless works. And again, you know, if you're, if you're wondering like, hey, is this like a special movement? Is this crazy? No, th this is about the most straightforward Swiss made movement from that time era than I could imagine. This is exactly how all of them are built. It is a time proven formula that is still used to this day. So now we've got most of the keyless works out, but there's still the yoke and the yoke spring. So there's the yoke there. Whoop, it jumped, but that's a big part. It didn't go far. Now we can just grab the yoke spring, which is quite a strong spring actually, but it comes out nicely. And that leaves us with the setting lever. And again, this one is actually held in place by a tension spring rather than a screw. A screw would be the slightly more commonly seen one, but these are very common as well. Seiko also uses this. And we can take out the winding stem and then the rest should just fall down and get maybe caught up on my <laughs> movement holder, but that's fine. There we go. And now we're gonna put the balance back on the main plate and that's just for cleaning purposes because we want to make sure that the balance is protected and if it's screwed down onto the main plate it can't go flying around in the cleaning basket when it's in the cleaning machine okay and now we can put it, the whole movement in the little basket here which is uh, which I'm attaching to my watch cleaning machine now And the watch cleaning machine is a four step process. The first step here is the cleaning solution. The next two are rinses. And then the last one on the left of it there is a heated drying cycle. And uh, man, this machine does really great work. It's old, as you can see, I've had it for a, a year or two now, but uh, you know, it works really, really well. All right, so we'll let that go cleaning. And let's take a look at this bezel under the microscope. First things first, yes, there is some rust but I can kind of get at it with my tweezers here to see what's underneath, if it's actually rusting into the metal or if it's more mm, cosmetic. And it looks like it's more cosmetic. So that's good news. It just needs to be cleaned up. So I'm just gonna break free a bunch of the rust with my tweezers here. And now we get to that crack that we saw on the bezel. So I, it's a little hard to see from here. So let's investigate further. First, I'm gonna try to clear away some of this debris and rust that's kind of formed around it. But you can see pretty clearly on the bottom that it's it's separated as a crack. But is it still holding on? Um, kind of. It looks like that wedged in piece of metal might be hanging on to some of the rust. But there's clearly enough play here that this bezel is no longer doing its job at least effectively. So let's clean everything up and then we'll take a look and try to address the, the bezel situation. I'm gonna put these in my ultrasonic cleaner and this is while the rest of the movement's going too. So getting a little, uh, little two for one here. And there we go. So we'll let that go for about 15 minutes and take a look and hey, these cleaned up really nice. You can see a little bit of staining where the rust was, but even on this side, it's just gone. Uh, so breaking it free with the tweezers and then getting into it seems to have really done the trick here as the case looks really, really nice now. Now this is the important part though, is the bezel. Now you can still see where that crack is and then maybe that little piece of metal there as well. But in order for us to really kind of understand what's going on with this thing, I think we're gonna have to go on the microscope because it's really kind of hard to see if this crack is all the way through or what it's done. We know it's weakened this thing, but let's take a look. And yeah, so that's the piece of metal that was in between, kind of lodged in between and it's fallen out now, but I still have it, it's tiny. But as you can see, it goes in here between the two pieces, but it is in fact broken. The the bezel has cracked due to some amount of some damage at some point. Who knows? 
when that happened. And that means that we're going to need to look at options on getting it secured. Now, the way you're supposed to do this is using a laser welder, which is like a $30,000 machine that they use at jewelry shops. But it's pretty expensive to have like just one weld done. So I'm going to use jeweler's epoxy. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, right, to, to do uh, an expensive repair on a watch that you didn't pay that much for. It's not worth it. So I'm going to try to use something that I've never used before here, which is this jeweler's epoxy. Now, this is um, very, very strong epoxy that is made for metals and, and some other materials as well. And I'm going to see if it will actually hold this bezel in place. Now, I would never recommend this as a permanent solution. Um, it needs to be welded back to be truly secured again. But... When you're working on somebody else's watch, right? They get to decide what they want to do with it. And it makes sense. I mean, you, you know, if you pay a couple hundred bucks for a watch, you don't want to pay $300. I, I don't know how much it costs exactly, but you know, just using a hypothetical to get the bezel repaired, right? And so that's where, uh, you know, you have to be kind of a problem solver and come up with other options. So that's what we're going to do here with this jeweler's epoxy. And we'll see if it'll hold. So epoxy is basically glue, but it comes in, separated so that it, it's not sticky and, and doesn't dry up quite yet. And you want to do an equal mix of 50% of the hardener and 50% of the epoxy. And so I'm going to mix those together until they're really, really well mixed. And then I'm going to use an oiler to try to get in because the, the key here is that you want to use as little as possible. Now, this isn't actually the bezel in my hand. This is a key ring that I broke <laughs> and I'm just using it as a little practice run to see how the epoxy sticks to it. Um, you know, how the pieces go back together. Does a ton of epoxy come out when I do this? This is me just doing a trial run that's on something that doesn't matter versus the thing that, you know, is real. I'll grab a cleaning swab just in case there's any excess and let's head over to the microscope and get things rolling on this epoxy job. Now, I'm using a tiny droplet on the tip of an oiler here. I really wanna use you know the, the minimum amount. I don't want extra because I don't wanna be able to see it and I wanna make sure that there's a good seal. And it looks like it's flowing in between the parts here, so that's great news. Now, the other thing I have to contend with is that there's that third kind of triangle of metal that goes in between that had fallen out. And I want to make sure that that gets replaced so that the bezel looks as smooth as possible. And also in case like geometrically speaking, that piece is important. I want to make sure uh, that it's in there as well. And it looks like, yeah, the, the epoxies float into the cracks. We've got a nice seal and, uh, and uh, this, we're going to give this the best shot that we can. So the only other thing we need to do is make sure that the, uh, that there's pressure on it. And so I'm gonna use some tape here around the outside of the bezel to make sure that it stays clamped down and that it can dry. The bezel, of course, is really important. It holds the crystal in place and then it holds itself onto the front of the watch. And if it were to come off and you were to brush your watch which, with the hands exposed up against like a shirt, it could easily damage them, it could rip them off, and uh, it would be kind of a disaster. So hopefully this works. The only thing left to do now is to let it sit overnight. So let's do that. And while we'll do, while we do that, we'll take a look at the dial here. Um, this dial is in pretty dang good shape, so we don't have to do a lot, but it could use some touching up. You can see there's some dirt and some spots on it. So once again, we're gonna grab our cleaning swabs here and a little bit of water, nothing fancy at all, and just give this a little touch up. And as you can see straight away, some of the dots are ready to come off. Uh, some of them aren't as well. I'm gonna be careful with this, but with these uh, porcelain or enamel dials, you can usually get in there and clean them pretty good. The print's kind of underneath, so it doesn't come off easily. And I can already see the improvement in it. Um, it's just brighter. It just, it just had a little haze of something on it. It's also important to remember that the crystal had a small crack. That will allow contaminants inside. Even the smallest crack will allow little bits of dust and stuff. So this dial probably could use, you know, this a little bath. As you can see, some of the dots are more like stains 
Uh, that could be from the rust or from whatever caused the rust. And they are more stubborn and won't come up. And that just is what it is. With vintage watches, you get a little bit of patina sometimes. You don't want to wipe that out. The only thing that you want to address is dirt that's like standing on the dial. Uh, I don't know anybody who thinks that that's like cool, <laughs> right? But I know a lot of people who think that natural patina is really cool, including me. And so for me, as a watch restorer, I just need to make sure that I uh, walk that fine line where I'm not taking off patina, but where I, where I am cleaning. So I'm happy with the dial, and that means that we can get back to reconstructing the movement and making sure that it's running well, and we can also address the issue with the hands uh, falling out of alignment too. So let's get this thing running again, and then we'll start to address any of the issues that the owner had as we uh, move our way through getting this thing running again. So first we'll put the train of wheels on, escape wheel, fourth wheel, third wheel, is what you can see there. And then the last one that'll go in here is the center wheel. This is really a good shot of like the simplest, the most, the, the part of the watch is kind of the most important. So we'll start with the barrel bridge here. Not too difficult to get lined up as you only have to line up the barrel and the center wheel and that's no big deal. Now, when it comes to putting on the train wheel bridge, however, it's a little trickier. Uh, the train wheel bridge has three different pivots that you need to line up and they're much smaller, which makes it a lot harder. But I've got a good technique that I learned from our friend Mark Lovick over at the Watch Repair channel, which by the way, if you're looking to get into the hobby, uh, his stuff is great. And also he has a website, watchfix.com, where you can take classes of which I took all and basically learned everything I know from. Highly recommended. And what he recommends is gently pushing down with a piece of peg wood or this red stick here to let the wheels kind of get aligned. And then you can hold that down while you initially do the screws. And that works really well. And as I said, I mean, it's one of the million things I've learned from Mark over there. He's really kind of my inspiration for, uh, doing watch repair. And, uh, yeah, if you're looking to get into it, watchfix.com, take the classes. That's what I took. And no, I'm not being paid for this. So this is just because I think his stuff's really great. Okay. So now we can put the click and the click spring in place as we work our way over to the barrel. And this thing's coming together pretty quickly. I, you know, some of the watches we've done on the channel uh, are pretty complicated. This one's not. So that's, this is kind of the fun part when you really start to feel more confident about what you know about this and then can kind of start to cruise through like this. Okay, just double check that the click is engaging with the spring and it looks like it is, so that's good. Also, before I put on the ratchet wheel, I'm gonna lubricate the, uh, the barrel and there's a little bit of uh, HP 1300 oil just to make sure that the barrel can smooth, uh, turn smoothly. And now I can put on the uh, ratchet wheel. Ratchet wheel is always kind of interesting because it actually has a square opening at the bottom that in interfaces with the top of the barrel arbor. So you have to make sure that it's lined up correctly. And the reason for that is that when that way, when the barrel arbor turns or when this turns, it, they interface with each other. If they were both round, they would just rotate. But if they're square, one turns the other. That makes sense. Okay, so now I can tighten down the barrel. I just like to just give it one extra little eighth of a turn there just to make sure that it's on all the way. And now we can turn our attention over to the crown wheel. Okay, rest of the crown wheel can go on now. And again, this one's held on by two little tiny screws. They are so small. And I'm actually just gonna go ahead and not fully tighten down, but get the first one kind of going. 
That way I can help me align the other one. Cause if you do both, sometimes one knocks the other out. So a little mini tip there. And now I can secure both of them. And just make sure that those are engaging properly and that the click's working. As you can see, the center wheel and the rest of the training wheels will turn if I wind that up at all. And that's because there's nothing holding it back. I don't have the pallet fork in yet, but that's what I wanted to see. Okay, so now we can flip the movement over and uh, put our attention towards the keyless works. This blue stuff I'm putting on this part here is a grease. It's actually like a high tension grease. And that's the clutch wheel that I'm putting in. This one is what we call the sliding clutch. And I'm gonna put some grease on the winding stem as well, as once again, it's a pretty high friction part of the watch, the keyless works. Okay, that looks right. And now we can grab the setting lever And again, it's got a spring underneath it. And just make sure that that's engaged with the stem properly. And there we go. That is exactly what you want to see. So finishing up the keyless works, we can put the yoke and then the yoke spring in. And then the setting lever spring kind of buttons everything up. And the yoke spring's a little finicky, but there we go. There we go. That's how you do it. And again, a little bit of grease here. In fact, a little bit too much grease there. And I'm gonna to need to clean that up with some Rotico. Just, you don't wanna to use too much. It, it's almost always a question of how, of, of using, it's almost never that you use not enough grease or oil. It's almost always that you use too much. Okay, now we can put an intermediate wheel in here. And now finally, the setting lever spring. Again, this also acts as kind of an extra cover. And we are really getting close to being done here with getting the movement back together at least. Okay, and then tighten it down fully. And a quick check just to make sure that the, uh, that the keyless works is going into the two positions, hand setting and winding, and a little bit of grease on each of those parts of the spring just to make sure that it can smoothly engage into both positions. Like that. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. And then a quick cleanup with the Rotico, just because you don't want anything kind of sitting out like that. And now we can put the cannon pinion back on. Now, this is an interesting situation that we have here because this could be the source of the issue and that it could be loose. Sometimes a cannon pinion can be loose, and if that's the case, the hands can fall out of alignment. So that's the first thing I need to check is, do I need to tighten up this cannon pinion? But from what I can see, 
No, not really. Um, at least not yet. So let's go ahead and oil the jewels. You can see this is on the microscope just to uh, make sure that I get the oil in the right spot. Okay, so with that done, let's try to see if the watch will run. It should, right? It was running before. Maybe a better question would be, how well will it run? So the pallet fork bridge and the pallet fork goes in. And we'll just tweak the pallet fork until the pivot lines up with the jewel and the pallet fork can move back and forth freely. And then I can gently grab the screws for it and we can secure the pallet fork bridge. And another quick check of the pallet fork, just to make, that it, make sure that it's moving freely. There should be no tension on it right now. So let's actually put the crown in and the stem and wind it up and make sure that there's some tension coming down the train of wheels. It should jump over to the other side. Yeah, like that. Yeah. All right, so with that done, we can grab the balance and put it back in, and let's see if we can't get this thing running. Oh, jumps right to life, look at that. This thing was ready to go. <laughs> There's still no replacing that feeling. It feels particularly good <laughs> when, uh, when the watch wasn't running, but even when it was, it still feels good. Give it a nice full wind. Okay, so that still leaves the uh, cap jewels to be lubricated and cleaned. So in order to get to the cap jewels, we need to take off the shock spring or at least move it out of the way temporarily, like that. And then I actually like to use a little piece of Rotico to grab the shock setting out. And now that it's been cleaned and re-lubricated, we can replace it. These are on the balances, the balance pivots. And sometimes it's easier just to turn the whole thing over so you can kind of drag the spring over rather than shoving it into place. See, see how much easier that was? And of course there's also one on the bottom. That way if you drop your watch, it won't uh, break the pivots. That spring actually acts as like a shock absorber. But while they were in there, they also said, well, hey, we can, we can do a nice little jewel setup that kind of suspends the oil right where you need it to be. And here you can see I actually just took off the cap jewel, but not the bottom part, and that'll come out too. And again, these have now been cleaned and oiled, but I missed. <laughs> Whoops. There we go. A little bit of finessing shall we say and then we can close up shop here there we go so let's get it back on the time grapher and after some tweaking see how it does and the answer is, it's doing great. Look how good this thing's running. A nice amplitude bump, really great rate, and we've got that beat error down to basically nothing. So back to the bezel. It is dried up, it's been a day now. And we can take a look at it and see how it did. Now, I don't, I mean, mainly I just wanna see if the bezel is still 
held together. I'm going to give it a little bit of a pull. I don't want to go crazy, I, you know, but it looks like it has actually adhered and stayed in there and it might work. Quick test fit of the bezel still feels a bit loose. Like it doesn't feel like how it should at all as far as tightness goes, but it is gripping the case. And that I think is about as good as I'm going to get by using this epoxy method. I can do a quick test fit of the old crystal as well because my plan is to replace the crystal and things get kind of weird. So I've ordered multiple sizes of this crystal. Look at that. Uh, 27.8 all the way up to 28.4. Now, normally you'd want one to be, you know, a little bit bigger than the thing that it's going in. Then you bend down the crystal and then it expands out. But in this case, I'm going to use the smallest one that I can get away with because I don't want any undue pressure on the inside of that bezel. I want one that just barely fits. So that's the one that I've chosen here. And I'm glad I ordered the extras because it wasn't the one that I originally measured. So this is a kind of a special case. And so, you know, I decided to, to order four different sizes for the same one just to be sure. And, you know, worst case, you just keep the extras and maybe you use them down the line. Okay, so let's get the rubber press out here and gently put this crystal in. See, again, I don't want to shove this crystal in or try to click it in with my hands. That bezel is hanging on, but I want it to keep on hanging on. So now that the crystal's centered, I can press it down, and then that just basically bends it down like an umbrella. And then I can put the bezel around the outside of it and then lift it back up and then like an umbrella opens, it will seal itself in, hopefully just so. Because if it's too much, it could easily pop that epoxy and then we're kind of back to square one. So let's take a look. All right, looks like the epoxy's holding and it looks like the crystal is actually in there where it's not gonna just come out on its own. So I think mission accomplished here, so far at least. Okay, now there's one last thing to take a look at though. And if you take a look, this is when I took the watch apart. Do you see what's missing here? Take a close look. Right there is the hour wheel in the middle. That is supposed to have a washer on top. It's like a little brass looking thing. And what it does is it keeps that thing pressed down so that it can't fall out of alignment with the minute hand, which is next to it, or the minute wheel, which is next to it. And it was missing. So I think that that's why my friend was having the issue with the hands coming out of alignment. The Canon pinion is a little bit loose, but I don't think that's actually the problem. So I'm going to go ahead and replace that dial washer with one from this bag. And then we're, I'm going to wear this watch around and make sure a, that the, uh, that the bezel stays on and B that the hands don't come out of alignment. So now we can grab the dial that we've cleaned up and we have the dial washer in place. So we've replaced that and we can put the, the final touches on this. Okay, so dial secured, and now it's time to put the hands back on. I'm gonna use my new hand setting tool that I got. Again, this feels right, everything's good, it's not scraping or doing anything wrong, and we can put the minute hand on. And you want to kind of just get the hand started and then get it aligned and then you want to press it into place with whichever tool you're using to do so. Like that. Okay, so dial on. Let's make sure it's working. Again, it's also important just to check this to make sure that the hands stay aligned, that they don't touch each other and that everything feels right. And this feels pretty good. Again, it is very easy to turn, but I don't think that that's actually causing an issue at this point. And as long as everything stays aligned, just like that, 
then we can go ahead and continue with the reassembly into the case. Okay, just make sure that everything's functional when it's in the case, looks good. Wind it up, everything's fine. So make sure that there's no dust or anything like that on the underside of the crystal or on the watch dial. And now this is about, I gotta be as gentle and even pressured as I can to get this to stick back on and see if it's gonna actually stay. Cause this is kind of the big test, right? To make sure that that bezel actually stays on. Now we've got the case clamps to put back on as well so that the movement will stay at the right height within the case and doesn't fall forward into the crystal, that kind of thing. Okay. And the case back can go on. And we can take a look at how it looks. Now, from a visual standpoint, it's gorgeous, right? This thing just looks sweet, new crystal, nice little cleanup. I asked the owner if he wanted to do any polishing on the case, and he said he'd rather keep it original. So that's that's what I'm doing here. I usually do that on mine as well. But as you've seen on the channel, sometimes I'll, I'll do a little polishing on the case. But he liked the vintage look here, a little bit beat up, no problem. And we're done. And as you can see, the watch came out beautifully. A lovely little dress watch from Universal Genève, and I'm sure its owner will wear it with pride. Thank you so much for coming along with me for yet another journey here on my channel. Uh, if you would like to follow me on Instagram, uh, I post project updates and stuff over there. It's wristwatch underscore revival. And of course, if you'd like to support what I'm doing here on the channel, you can do so via the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. You get a thank you card and a sticker from wristwatch revival at whatever level you sign up for. And I wanted to particularly thank Trevor, Seth, Ross, Robert, Mitchell, Mikey, Kevin, James, George, Erica, Dustin, Brinton, Brian, Brian, Brett, Brad, and Alex for their support. And last but not least, I want to thank you for spending some time with me. We'll see you next time.